So here's a little issue we have in America today. Um, there are, are currently about 250,000 people a year who are dying in our hospitals due to, uh, due to preventable deaths. And I'm not talking about negligence, I'm talking about little accidents, right? Um, I'm talking about the doctor in the morning not properly briefing the doctor for the evening. You know, I'm talking about things that, you, you know, we can't sue anybody. There's nothing, there's nothing that we can see that's wrong. But there's 250,000 preventable deaths every year. That's um, about 2747s going down every single week. That's what's the equivalent to. And the confusing thing is that we have the best doctors in the world. We have the most advanced technology in the world. Some of the medical equipment we have is the best in the world. The medicines we have are the best in the world. So you start asking yourselves, why are these things happening? And the reason is not because of any of those things. The reasons are actually something vastly more simple. It's something very, very human. 5% of hospital administrators are doctors. Most of them are number crunchers. Hospitals are run like businesses. Hospitals are run by the numbers. And the problem isn't the people uh, who are giving the care, they're very highly trained. The problem is the way those people are cared for. Because what we've done is we've created cultures in hospitals where the people who are doing the caring aren't cared for. And so all of these little preventable deaths are happening because they don't feel like they're a part of anything. They're just doing their jobs and they don't get along that well and there's not a lot of camaraderie. And the impact is death, right? Now I use this example because it's exaggerated because the impact is so powerful. But the problem is the same in our own companies, right? Which is we come to work and we're told you must care for your clients, you must care for your customers, you must make them the focus of all you do, and yet why aren't the people who are managing us from the top caring about us? So yes, in a hospital the impact is worse, but the impact that we're having on the outside world is just as bad. In other words, we're not working at our best. We don't care for the things we're doing. We're not helping each other is the most important part. And the residual impact is that we are unfulfilled by the work that we do. And when we're unfulfilled by the work that we do, we focus on the details. And when we focus on the details, we retract from each other. When we retract from each other, we feel lonely. And when we feel lonely, cancer goes up, heart disease goes up, diabetes goes up. In other words, by going to work, we're killing ourselves. Literally. There's another study that was released not that long ago that says that uh, parents who work late, the negative impact that it has on their children is little to none. They may feel guilty as parents, but the negative impact that it has on the raising of their children is little to none. However, parents who come home from jobs they hate or don't love, their kids are more likely to be bullies at school. And now you think about the bullying epidemic we have in America right, where there's this disturbing number of young children who are killing themselves, suicides, because of bullies. The problem is not the schools, and the problem isn't even the parenting. The problem is the jobs the parents have. This is the importance and this is the power of the work that we do and the places we go to work, right? Most of us, I mean, like, you listen to the, 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 uh, the unemployment statistics. They say, you know, we're all-time high, record high, 9 to 10 percent unemployment, right? And people go, oh my God, that's terrible. And I hear that number and I go, well, that means 91 percent still have a job, right? Now, granted, we want to get that employment number up, but that means 91 percent are still going to work. The question is, how many of them are coming home fulfilled by the work that they do, and how many of them are waking up inspired to go back to work the next day? If we don't love our works, we don't look out for each other. And if we don't look out for each other, we feel lonely. If we don't feel lonely, all these negative things happen. So what example can I share with a creative audience about how to change this? The United States Marine Corps. I had the great honor last week of uh, spending a week with the Marines. I spent a couple days at Camp Lejeune, and then I went for a few days to um, Paris Island to watch them go through boot camp. And this is an, a, rem it's a remarkable, remarkable human experiment that they're doing. And even though they know what works, they don't know why it works, but they don't need to know why because they know that it works, right? But what's happening is they're taking a group of strangers, people who don't know each other, who are showing up and within a very, very short period of time, learn to trust each other so much that they would give their lives for each other. 
right? And we know, everyone, sort of anyone who's ever worn a uniform knows that no one runs into battle for God and country. It doesn't happen. It's for the guy to the left of me and the guy to the right of me. That's the reason they do what they do. Right? And these sort of remarkable stories of heroism where people rush into very, very dangerous situations to save others. And they always ask the question, why did you do it? Why would you risk your life? Why would you put yourself at risk for them? And the answer is always the same, because they would do it for me. In other words, what gives them the confidence to put themselves at great risk is the knowledge that someone would do the same for them. We would put ourselves at great risk for our companies if we knew that our companies would put themselves at great risk for us, but they don't, so we don't. Now, one of the things that's remarkable about the Marines, and if you go read, and you know, this is the most, the, I asked these young, and they're 21, 22 years old, some of these, these Lance Corporals, the grunts, you know, the guys, the infantry, I mean, this is the lowest of the low, the ones we actually send into battle, the front lines. And I asked them, are you misunderstood in America? And they said, yes, unanimously, they all nodded. I said, what, what, what do people think of you? And one stood up and says, they think we're baby killers. I said, how does it feel? He says, it hurts. And when I say, well, tell me a story then that captures to you what it means to be a Marine, the feeling you have of being a Marine, tell me a story that captures it. And I expected to hear stories of, I took a hit and somebody saved me, or I ran into a firefight and pulled somebody. I expected these stories of heroism. Not a single story like that came out. Now, I'm sure those stories exist, but those aren't the, to the stories they told me that capture what it means to be a Marine. One of the stories they told me was a young boy in Afghanistan who would come around every morning and sell kebabs to the Marines. And then one day he showed up and he was all beaten up. And he didn't go to his parents for help and he didn't go to his friends to help. He came to the Marines for help because he trusted them more than anyone else. They told me a story that captured how they feel of a village that had been overrun by the Taliban and the residents of the village could, couldn't go home because they would be killed by the Taliban and so they were just living by the river. The problem was winter was coming and one of the, uh, the elders came to the Marines, knocked on the door and said, I need you to come down to the river and kill us. And the Marine said, what are you talking about? He says, if we go back home, we'll be killed by the Taliban. And if we stay out there, we're going to die slow deaths this winter. It's easier if you just come and kill us, please. The Marines overran the Taliban village, pushed the Taliban out. A year later, they went back to this village and people were playing volleyball. These were the stories they told me that capture what it means to be a Marine. They believe in doing good for others. And the fulfillment they get when they put themselves at risk so that others may prevail is overwhelming. This is not unique to the Marine Corps. This is all human beings. The feeling of fulfillment comes from doing something for another. The feeling from fulfillment comes from the exertion of time and energy for someone else. If you are walking to work and you th throw a few pennies in a cup and you come to, f to work and you say to your friends, hey guys, I gave a dollar to somebody homeless this morning. What are your friends going to say? Uh, good, right? I gave 20 bucks to somebody homeless. They'd be like, uh, good for you, right? What if you come in in the morning and you say, hey, I gave up my Saturday and I went and painted a school in the inner city. People go, whoa, cool, wow, cool. And all of a sudden, not only are they inspired to do something good themselves, but the feeling that, that you have persists. The amazing thing is that when we do good for others, it actually inspires others to do good for others. This is provided for us primatologically, anthropologically. It's a, all part of the survival of the species. You know, sex feels good so that we'll do it, so we can procreate and perpetuate the species, but we're social animals, and so we have to provide for the fact that we'll maintain strong bonds and build cultures, right? Because that's what humans do, we're cultural animals. And so when we do good for others and we look out for those in our tribe, we look out for those in our group, it actually feels good. Biologically, it releases oxytocin. This chemical that's released when you do good for others is released and it makes you feel good. And the amazing thing is the more oxytocin you have in your body, the more you want to do good for others. The problem is we've replaced this feeling, the exertion of time and energy, with digital communications. We've replaced it with headphones. We've replaced it with money, right? Think about the invention of money, right? It used to be, money, you know, it used to be like you go to someone's house, you cook them dinner, and the deal was they'll do the dishes. Time and energy, exchange for time and energy. And someone said, I'll give you an IOU, right? Someone says, I don't feel like doing the dishes, 
So I'm going to give you an IOU that I promise to do them another day, right? And that's what money is. It is the promise for future goods or services. The promise of future goods and services. In other words, we've replaced our own time and energy with promises for someone else to do it another day, right? In other words, there's no exertion of time and energy. And so the feeling people get is that I did something for you and you did nothing for me. You replaced it with a piece of paper, with an IOU, with a promise for future goods and services. The way we find fulfillment is by doing good for others. So how do the Marines do it? How do you get people to do good for others? We all know this. Intellectually, we know that it's good to do good for others. But why don't we do it then? Why don't we do it? And what the Marines learned is something that I completely did not expect. They can't just yell at these guys to help each other. That's not what happens. There's a few things that they have to do first. So we all have heard of the obstacle course, right? The Marines have a thing called the obstacle course. And this is where they, they build anaerobic strength and aerobic strength, muscle strength, and it's timed and all of this good stuff. They have another course called the confidence course, and it's never timed. And most of the obstacles on this course cannot be completed by yourself. They must be completed in teams. You have no choice. That's just how it's designed. And what they say is the first two weeks of boot camp, everybody's there to outdo each other and prove that they're strong. Just kind of like when we start in a job, we prove we want to show how great we are, we'll work a little harder, we'll do good work, look how good my design is, right? It's all about us and how good we are, right? But they keep putting them in situations where they can't do things by themselves. And what starts to happen very slowly, they said after about two weeks, they start cheering for each other. Now they get in trouble when they do, but they start cheering for each other. And then before too long, you see them organically start helping each other. <clears throat> and what happens is if there's one person who's weak and refuses to help each other, the others, or even if there's one person who's strong, who's, you know, I was the star college athlete, and they get to every, the end of every obstacle, and they just stand there and wait for everybody to finish, and they don't help each other, what starts to happen is organically the group starts to ostracize that person. Organically, they get ostracized until they learn that the only way that they will get through this thing, the only way they will survive boot camp, is if they ask for help because they have no option. The problem is no one will help them until they're willing to help another. It's the deal we have to make. It's called vulnerability and risk. We have to take the risk to make ourselves vulnerable. Yes, you might do something for someone else and they may not do something back for you. That's the risk you run. That's the risk you run. It's not about, it's not about <clears throat> giving everything to them and, and sort of huge, big, overwhelming risk. It's about little things and little things. It's like going on a date, right? It's like if I went on a date with somebody, I came home and I said, uh, after one date, I said, I'm marrying her. And people are like, what are you, nuts? I'd be like, I'm in love. They're like, but you're, you're, this, is, this is crazy. I'm like, I know, I'm in love, you know? <laughs> She feels the same way. We both know it's nuts, right? Now you know that you're going to be like, eh, go on a couple more dates, right? <laughs> we know instinctively that the strong bond that's create, that, that needs to be created first takes more than a week, right? We know that, right? But if I've been dating somebody for seven years and we haven't you know, married, you'd be like, dude, what is wrong, right? In other words, we know that it takes more than seven days and we know that it takes less than seven years. The problem is, we don't know how long it takes. It's somewhere in the middle. All human bonds are the same. Like when you show up at work, when you show up for the first time, when you're new, don't expect that people will look out for you and they won't expect you to look out for them in seven days. It won't happen. But if you've been working at a job for a few years and you don't have the, un the, the, sort of the, the absolute confidence that if you turn your back you will not get stabbed, you can rely on somebody, you can give them something, nothing will go wrong, you will share the credit, no one will throw you under the bus. If you don't have that in a few years, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I don't know how long it takes, but I know that's more than a week and I know it's less than seven years. And the Marines fundamentally understand that before anyone is willing to put themselves out for another, they have to have self-confidence real self-confidence. You have to be confident in yourself and your own ability before you're willing to help another. If you're insecure at all about your own ability, it's, an oxy it's sort of a paradox, right? How, am I, how can I overcome my confidence, you know, my self-confidence? And we all have ego issues at all times, you know, we all do, right? But if I'm not confident in myself, I won't help another. It's a paradox because then we need someone to look out for us before we're willing to help our peers, right? This is what management is supposed to do. The drill instructors, the school, they are there, our parents, they are there for one reason and one reason only, to help us feel strong and good about ourselves. 
But look at the way we talk to each other. Look, at the, look, a budget's been cut. And so what do you get told? I need you guys to do more with less. Right? That's what we're told. Hey guys, I need you guys to do more with less. That's what we're told by our clients, by our bosses, by our parents. This is what we're told. Right? That's like your parents telling you when you're young, I know you're stupid, figure it out. <laughs> right? You're not as smart as the other kids. What do you want me to do? Right? It's the exact same thing. I need you to do more with less. Right? What we need to be telling people is, I need, to do, I need you to do more with what you have. Right? You have capacity, you have strength, you have talent, you have ability. I need you to do more with what you have. We don't celebrate what we've got. We criticize for what we don't have. This is the responsibility of management, to take us under their wing and help us understand our own value to ourselves. Close your eyes and think back to high school. And think of that one teacher who took you under their wing and cared for you and looked after you and helped you realize that you are capable of more than you thought you were. And you, and you, you probably are the person you are today in some part because of that person, right? Do you have that name? What's the name? Tell me the name. Tell me the name of the teacher. Okay, give me the name. Okay, I can point to anybody and you can tell me that name. Now tell me the names of all the other teachers you had that day. Can't remember them, can you? This is the power of those who teach us confidence. We will literally carry their names around with us for the rest of our lives. Wouldn't you want to be that person? Wouldn't you want to be the person that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, I can do this exercise with somebody and they will tell me your name. This is the power of helping others realize their own strengths. This is what management and leadership is supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be caring for us and helping us realize our own value. And by the way, if you have anybody who reports to you or works for you, your responsibility is not to make them meet the deadline. Your responsibility is not to make sure that they do as you say. Your responsibility is to make sure that they understand their own strengths, their own value, and that they are way, way more talented than they think they are. And the only way they will learn that is if you put them in situations in which they can fail. And you hold them and you support them and you give them talent and you give them skills and you give them education and you watch their backs and if they fall over you encourage them to get back up and if they fall over you encourage them to get back up and if they fall over you encourage them to get back up until they figure it out themselves. It's called confidence. It's your responsibility to help others find it and it's others' responsibility to help you, f you find yours. And the amazing thing is as soon as you start feeling confident in your own ability, you naturally help each other. That's what happens. It's called trust. In the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may gain. In business, we are willing to give bonuses to people who will sacrifice others so that we may gain. We have it backwards. And then we complain about how we don't love our jobs and we complain about how the work is suffering and we complain about how budgets are being cut and we compl complain, complain, complain. And the first thing we do is blame each other and become more selfish and worry about my pay and my benefits and my this and this is what happens. When we are unfulfilled, we look at the metrics and we say they're not good enough. When we are fulfilled, we don't care about the metrics. This is why when you have a job you love and you get a call that says I'll offer you tons more money and great benefits, you're like, I'm not interested, I'm not interested, ah, I'm not interested. I'm very happy here, but we'll give you more. That's not the reason I'm here. I'm here because I love it. I'm here because I care for the people I work with and I'm here because the people I work with care for me. This is the world I imagine. This is the world I imagine. And here's the great thing. If you take little risks, I'm not talking about big things, little things. If you start doing little things for each other, the amazing anthropological response is other people will start doing little things for others too. I was walking down the street two days ago and a guy's backpack was open and a whole bunch of paper fell out as he was walking down the street. And I happened to be behind him and so my friend and I just sort of, we were in mid-conversation and in mid-conversation, we never even stopped talking. We just bent down, sort of helped him gather his papers, hand them back to him, sort of pointed out that his book bag was, his, you know, his backpack was unzipped and he said thanks and we walked on. It was like no big deal, right? We get to the end of the, the street and we stand at the, the, we're waiting to cross the street. We're still talking, we haven't stopped talking. And the guy in front of us turns to us and says, I saw you help that guy. That was really cool. 
But here's what's great about that. The guy will go do something for someone else simply because he saw us bend down and pick up paper for someone else. He will actually go do something for someone else because of it. Right? He, he won't give to charity because I, he sees me put a dollar in a cup. But he will actually help someone because he saw someone also help someone. Little things. Hold a door open for someone. Say thank you to the person who holds the door open for you. Smile to the barista. Little, little things. You're, you know, put your foot in the subway when the door is closing so someone who's running will make it. Hit the open at the, at the elevator. Don't go... <laughs> or pretend you didn't see. That's the best one. You know? Oh, I didn't wish I would have if I saw. Sorry. Right? Do it. A little time and a little energy. And you'll find around work that people give a little time and a little energy back to you. And you'll give a little more time and a little more energy. You go for a coffee with someone. Then you go for a two-hour coffee. Then you go for a coffee and a lunch. Then you go for a lunch and a dinner. Then you go for a dinner and a movie. And then you sleep over. And then you sleep over two nights. And then you go on holiday together. And eventually you get married. Right? It's slow. It takes time. And we can't rush it. You know, if when we rush it, it's all fake. Do things for others and watch, watch how much others do for you. Buy, you know, go, you go get yourself a cup of coffee from the coffee sheet machine in the morning, make one for someone else. It takes a little extra time, it takes a little extra energy. That's the point. That's the point. And here's the best part. You will feel so good at the end of the day. So good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. How do you convince some, how do you, you know, so what are the metrics? How do you convince a skeptical audience of this trust metric? Um, you don't. You don't, right? You can't twist anybody's arm to do something that they don't want to do. And, you know, the law of diffusion, which I obey, you know, as hard as, as much as I can, which is you don't need the majority you need those people who believe what you believe. In other words, if you buy, if you, you know, when you go sort of, when you do some nice things for people, they may not do something nice back because they may be, you know, we live in a world in which you do something for somebody, they think you want something from them, right? That's unfortunately the society we've created. But, but that's the risk that we keep taking. I'm not saying you should keep doing it for somebody who keeps doing nothing and keeps sort of, you know, crapping on you because of it. Then at some point you have to be like, all right, my bad. My bad, right? And you back off. You know, uh, I don't believe in helping everyone. I do not believe in it, right? Um, this is not, you know, let's do good for everyone in the, on the planet. That's not what I'm talking about. Mother Teresa, who's the poster child for giving selflessly to all who need, at the end of her life started questioning the existence of God and, by the way, hated her life. Serious, okay? In other words, giving to others unabashedly is actually self-destructive. It doesn't help, right? And it's just like going on dates with people you don't like doesn't mean you'll eventually click and marry, <laughs> right? We, the, the, there's, there's only one machine that I found that really accurately measures trust better than any other sort of metric. It's called the human being. It's really good at it, right? And so those feelings you get, trust them in one way or the other. You know, it's, it's the little risks, it's the butterflies, it's the un unsure, you know, it's the, it's the backwards and forth, it's the dance, it's dating, it's the dance, it's the nerves, like, I, you know, it's that. So if there are, if there are cynical bastards at your office who, who, are, who, who don't get it, ignore, ignore them, don't worry about it. Because eventually you'll get enough and those people either come along or leave, or be pushed out. You know, ostracized, remember? When the group starts helping each other, they ostracize the ones who refuse to help, whether they're strong or whether they're weak. They get ostracized until they learn, until they learn that they cannot survive without the help of others, and they learn that the only way others will help them is if they, if, if they help the others, right? The order matters. The order matters. I'll just, I just thought of something that, that sort of we, is pervasive in our sort of, you know, digital world. Uh, the order matters. You know, sort of speak honestly about what you want, right? If you are doing, don't do things for people when you want something from them. Just ask them what you want from them. And I'll give you one little example. It's a funny little example. We've all received emails that go like this. Dear Simon. Well, you wouldn't get an email to Dear Simon, but I would. <laughs> Dear, insert your name, right? Dear Simon, um, haven't seen you in years. 
Hope you're well. Congratulations on all you've been doing. It's really amazing. We should get copies sometime. If you could do me a favor, I'm, if you could vote for me on this website, I'm hoping to win you know, some thousand dollar prize for my design, blah, blah, blah. Hope you're well, talk to you soon, Kenny, right? We've all received an email like that. And how do we respond to it? Like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Now, what happens if you get the same email that goes like this? Dear Simon, I'm hoping you could vote for me on this website. I'm trying to win some thousand dollar prize for my design. I haven't seen you in years. I hope you're really well. Congratulations on all that you've been doing. We should get a coffee sometime. Thanks, Kenny. Totally different. In other words, when we know why you're emailing and it comes first, it has a remarkable impact. We know that all those pleasantries are just buttering us up to get to what they want. Right? But if you come right out with what you want, we're actually very grateful for the pleasantries. Right? It's the same thing in human interaction. Don't give someone a cup of coffee if you need a favor back. Just ask them for the favor. It builds trust. I can't trust you every time you do something nice for me. I think you just something, you want something from me. I won't trust you. And this is what companies do to us, right? Well, we did this for you. Why won't you do this for us? That's not how it works. Generosity, bending down to pick up the papers, holding the door op open for someone, is expecting nothing in return, ever. You do not give. You know, this is what happens in new business, right? We, b new business is built on relationships. And so we build the relationship, build the relationship, build the relationship until we're comfortable to ask for the business. In other words, you were only befriending me till the point you felt that I would let down my guard and you could ask me for something. The whole time you were just waiting for that time, it doesn't work that way. If you actually want to build relationships, you build relationships without wanting anything. And that's how you build trust. You want to know why the Marines gave me this incredible access? I mean, literally, they said, Simon, anything you want to see, you got it. Anything you want to do, you got it. You can go. We went past signs that said, no observers, no civilians beyond this point. I'm like, can I take pictures? They're like, go ahead. <laughs> you should see some of the pictures. They're unbelievable, right? I'm like right in there, Marines coming at me. We went out to the crucible, and they're all like, you know, they're like rolling in the dirt and like, you know, going under barbed wire, and I'm like, I'm not joking either. <laughs> They're like, you know? <laughs> Unprecedented access, access that journalists would be jealous of. Do you know why they gave it to me? Because in all the time that I've been visiting with Marines and having meetings with them, I've never asked for anything. I don't want anything and I don't have anything to sell. I just keep showing up and say, what do you need? How can I help? And at some point they said, when I called them and said, I need a little favor, because they know I haven't been waiting for the favor. It's the time now that I have a little favor. They go, absolutely, whatever you need. It's called human relationships. Companies don't do business with companies. People do business with people. You know, your company didn't win IBM as a client. Somebody who likes somebody said, we'll hire you. And if they didn't like you, they're just, you know, they're, they're, doing, they're playing roulette. Well, we're betting that, you know, <laughs> this will work out. Those are the weak relationships. Yes? How do you deal with the boss who's a jerk, or at least not yeah. getting it? The more we give, uh, the more it inspires others to give. But the more selfish we are, the more others become selfish around us. And so those are organizations in which selfish behavior prevails. And so we see the residual effects, which is they make decisions that ultimately screw us. They destroy our economy because of their selfish behavior. Right? We know this is what, what, what happens. Same in politics, right? Um, uh, and the answer is, don't worry about it. I know it sounds uh, silly. And you, so you, you, I mean, your first question is, do I talk about these things to them? I will talk to anyone who will listen. You know? <laughs> but I don't talk to people who don't want to listen. The good news is there are some good eggs. And there are some of them who've had conversions, where they were the bastards who believed in firing people and screwing people to advance their careers. And something happens. I just met a guy recently who was a very senior executive at a very, very large company. And something happened. And he, like, he got like, hit in the head or something. And he realized, holy cow, I have to look after people, right? and they become obsessed with it, and they start sticking their necks out. And, and we just need those champions scattered around. And this is what I do. The more I spread this message, the more it, uh, it sort of, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, in the, in, in the cartoons, sort of the whole of justice, you know, the, the message goes out and they all sort of like, you know, wherever they are, like, you know, they, they poke their heads up. It's that kind of thing. The more we talk about it, the more we put it in our work, the, you know, because don't forget, you're gonna help someone who goes home feeling good and their husband or their wife works in the bank. 
and they're going to talk how much about they love to, and that might inspire that person. You know, it's, it has all of these residual impacts that, that we don't really know. This is the funny thing about the internet, which is we're so proud of the internet that we can measure everything. No, you can't. You can only measure one layer, right? So for example, you say, Simon, what's the impact you're having? I don't know is the answer, right? I know, it's, it's, I know that it'll take more than a week and it'll take seven years, but I don't know when it's going to happen and I don't know how it's going to get there, right? All I can do is, is do it, right? But I have no clue how or when. And so, for example, I can measure book sales and I can measure how many hits and I can measure how many people have watched a TED Talk and all of this, but I can't measure, you know, that TED Talk being shown to a room of 50 people and one of those 50 people doesn't buy a book, doesn't watch a TED Talk, doesn't do anything, but goes out and does something good for somebody else. I have no way of measuring that. And so we're so proud of the internet and its ability to measure everything, but we're measuring one layer where we used to measure no layers. It's like, you know, this is how people work. It's, it's, it's gossamer, you know, it's networked. Um, and so the answer is don't worry about them. Don't worry about them. Worry about the people who you can care for, who you can give to, and when we reach a critical mass in society, it will tip, right? And if you don't believe me, the reason it is the way it is now is because it tipped the wrong way. There was no such thing as massive layoffs as, as business strategy prior to in the 1980s. It just wasn't done. It was done here and there, but it wasn't strategy. The idea of using layoffs to balance the books is a relatively new phenomenon that came for the increase of selfishness in the Gordon Gecko greed is good 1980s boom, right? Um, and uh, this was also the same exact period, the 1980s, where the theory, the theory of shareholder value was put forward, right? Because they had all of these people buying large companies and installing professional managers to run the companies that they bought, that they invested in, and they had a problem, which is those professional managers were paid for by the company, and those professional managers cared for the employees and the customers. And so the investors said, how do we protect our investments? We've got an idea. We're going to give them equity in the company and bonus them based on the performance, right? And so the shift happened where the CEOs started caring more about the investors and stopped caring about the customers and the employees. Those were theories introduced by some Harvard professor in the 1980s. We can push it back the other way, right? We can push it back the other way. Um, but we just have to, and, and there's just a, there was a, there was a uh, just the other day, which company was it? Uh, one of the large banks where the shareholder, uh, Citibank, Citibank. Yeah, Citibank, the shareholders voted, majority shareholders voted against a fat pay package. That's unprecedented. It has never happened, even in hard times, even when the company's doing this, the shareholders just, it's just sort of a, a, a cursory thing where they approve the $15 million bonus for the CEO. They voted against it. It's non-binding, but it sends a shot across the bow saying shareholders now want you to be bonused if you do something good for others even if the others is us, <laughs> right? The point is, is that it's, it's starting to crack. And so let's just stick our finger in the crack, you know, make sure that it keeps cracking. It swung one way, we can swing it back. The question was, can I talk about celebrating accomplishment while still asking for more, right? Um, to, to, so so um, they did a study on kids who are really, really smart, like in all the gifted classes. Why is it when you're smart, you're gifted, and when you're stupid, you're special? Why is that? <laughs> I was told my whole life I was special. It's not gonna, never gifted. Um, uh, they took the gifted kids who are constantly told, you're so good. Oh, thanks for that. I knew you'd do well. Oh, you're, the, you're our best employee. You know, you're our best student. You're awesome, right? And what happens is later in life, they actually suffer because they're very afraid of taking risk, because they're very afraid of losing their position on the mantle, okay? Kids who are sort of more average, who constantly are rewarded not for their accomplishment, but for their effort. Great effort. Really proud of the improvement you made. What they find is they do very well in life because there's no shelf. There's always more. There's more effort, right? And so you want to reward and acknowledge effort even if uh, they don't hit the goal, it's the, the delta. But at the same time, if it goes backwards, you'd be like, dude, what, what's going on? It's like we, don't get, we shouldn't be giving ribbons for everyone who competes, right? Because what we're teaching people is, if you do nothing, you get a medal, right? And the funny thing is, is we start, we're creating a generation that's feeling very hollow. 
and feeling, you know, this sense of entitlement that people complain about Gen Y. The entitlement is, I don't feel like I've accomplished anything. And the funny thing is about human beings is we, we, the, the way we feel accomplished is when we exert energy and time and reach a destination, right? And the more energy and time that we have to suffer through, especially if we suffer together and we get somewhere, it is overwhelming. Think about the best jobs you've ever worked on. Was it the best design? Was it the best results that the company had because of your, your project? Or was it a, an absolute hell project that you worked together and you came out on the other end and that you got it done at the deadline and you're like, that was amazing. It was the hell projects. It was the things that we had to go out of our ways more, do things for each other, right? Things we weren't thinking of doing. I was wrapping packages. I was doing stuff that aren't, designers aren't supposed to do. Going, you know, this is what produces that, right? And so, the, 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 the thing is about measurement and destination reward, imagine we're standing in a big empty room, right? And we're standing in one corner and I give you a simple instruction. I want you to go to that corner in a straight line, right? Off you go, no big deal, right? Without telling you, I slip a chair in front of you. What do you do? You go around the chair. Now you just disobeyed what I told you to do. I told you to go to that corner straight line. But this is the amazing things about human beings, which is when we're given a clear destination, we use our own creativity and our own sense of innovation and our own problem solving abilities to overcome obstacles to get to the destination. In other words, the destination is more important than the route, right? We are flexible about the route. We are obsessed with the destination. Reset. We're standing in the corner together and I give you a simple instruction. Go somewhere in this room in a straight line. And you say to me, well, where do you want me to go? I'm like, I don't know. You're smart, figure it out. Go in a straight line. And so you pick a point and you start walking and without telling you, I put a chair in front of you. And what do you do? You come to a grinding halt. And I say, what'd you stop for? You go, well, you put a chair in front of me. Or you'll make a sudden turn and go in another direction, right? And this is the problem. It's the same obstacle. The difference is when you have a clear, set, a clear destination, the obstacles become easy to overcome. When you don't have a clear destination, you keep coming to a grinding halt. And what we do in our companies is we're counting the steps we're taking along the route, but we're never looking at the destination, right? So a company says, Made a million dollars this year, we were only planning on making 800,000. Like we took 10 steps, we were only planning on taking eight. Where are you going? No clue, right? <laughs> we count the steps. And so the point is, is that people want to feel that the effort that they're exerting actually are moving somewhere. And so successful measurement, successful recognition is not just for the steps you take. It's not just for the effort, it's that the effort you exerted moved us closer to where we're trying to get to. And that get to should be some crazy ideal. My ideal is to live in a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning, you know, inspired to go to work and fulfilled by the work that they do. And the, the, the couple of measurements that I use are if the book is selling, and I, by the way, people ask me, how many have you sold? I have no clue. I've never asked the publisher because I don't care. I really don't care how many I've sold. What I care about is the Amazon rankings and that those are going steady or up and not plummeting because that means other people Right? Because I don't have a publicist, I don't have a marketing strategy on purpose. I didn't hire one of those companies to sell the book for me. And the reason is, is because I'm not interested in book sales. I'm interested in the spreading of an idea. And so I just use that as a metric to help me understand, am I sort of marching in the, because the more I preach, is it resonating? You know? And so you have a couple of these imperfect measurements that help you understand, are you going along the way? So it's not just great effort, look what you achieved, because that's what we're doing now. Right? Our goal is to increase top line revenues by $50 million. For what reason? Right? Which is we have to know the destination and then we say, amazing, you took us that much closer. And if we go to the right, it's because we were overcoming an obstacle. If we hadn't gone to the right, we would have been stuck forever. Thank you. You know? It's not always straight lines. It's not always straight lines. But it's, it's in one direction. She's pulling the cane out. Thank you very, very much.